Thanks very much, David. You know, yesterday we were talking about how we got here, but I want to move on to talking about policy to deal with the crisis. And there are three phases in any banking crisis. There are three phases, different characters to the policy phases after you realize you're in trouble. There's the containment phase, the resolution phase, and the prevention of the next crisis phase. So we're well into the containment phase now. Maybe it's nearly over. I'm not sure. It's always um, uh, uh, not necessarily a good idea to say it's over, the containment phase. We're really towards the start of the resolution phase, and then the prevention phase will, will come in its own good time. They are interlinked because what you do in one influences what you can do in the rest of them. So what about the containment phase? Well, there were several months of low-key containment efforts uh, behind closed doors during the early months of 2008, but I suppose Irish containment, well, there's no doubt, it moved into top gear at the end of September with the announcement of the emergency legislation for an extensive guarantee of the liabilities of the main Irish-controlled retail banks. It's a lot of adjectives. Many people ask me about... Uh, this particular decision, it was triggered by the effective failure of Anglo-Irish Bank. We'll hear more about Anglo-Irish Bank from, from uh, Alan later on, in very difficult international funding conditions. And it was just one of several dramatic containment steps taken by governments all over Europe and in the United States during September and October. But was it, was it a good idea? Uh, and really, having talked to an awful lot of central banking experts around the world. At first, they were skeptical, uh, shocked. I was shocked. But although one can quibble with the scope of the guarantee, with the evidently inadequate consultation with partner regulatory authorities elsewhere in Europe, and with the denial at that time of underlying solvency issues at Anglo, I think there's little doubt that an extensive guarantee of Irish, <laughs> of Irish banking liabilities was the correct immediate containment response. So there, there had to be an extensive guarantee given the situation that had emerged. So that's what we're into that now. We're handling the fallout of, of that, all still part of the containment phase. Let me show you two pictures. The scale, the first one here I'll explain. The scale of the Irish banking crisis and the fact that it occurred against the backdrop of the parallel but largely different collapse in international banking confidence all around the world has made containment quite difficult. And containment might not have been possible. It was not possible in, in Iceland, for example. Just had to let them go. We heard that yesterday. It might not have been possible without the help of the European Central Bank acting in accordance with the procedures and policies, the standing procedures and policies of maintaining the currency union. Now, the European Central Bank has now lent Irish banks a staggeringly large sum of money. And there's the figure there. That's got up to, that's Irish banks borrowing from central banks. There's a little small amount, I think, from the, from the Bank of England in there, but it's mostly from the European Central Bank. 130 something billion at the end of March. Uh, this money was needed to allow them to repay foreign market borrowing they had made over the previous five or six years. And you can see that in the next slide. See no borrowing, by, this is percent of GDP, no borrowing worth talking about for years and years. And then from 2003, this big run up in foreign bank borrowing. And then when well, it all has to be repaid and the foreigner is not really all that keen to lend to any banks, let alone Irish banks in uh, the late part of 2008. So all that repayment going on and being balanced back there by borrowing from the European Central Bank. Now, people haven't commented on that, but by being part of the system has allowed this transfer of borrowing from private foreign lenders to the European Central Bank. Handling containment is all about confidence. Well, it's not all about confidence. Uh, and that kind of thinking can lead to bad, poor, poor policy choices. But restoring and maintaining confidence is a key and essential part of the containment phase. And in the 
febrile atmosphere of financial markets that's prevailed during the past year, the Irish banking difficulties have had a clear knock-on effect on the cost of Irish government borrowing. I'll show you another slide. Uh, well, it meets the short, sharp fall in tax revenues and the heightened pressure on government spending. That's really having a larger impact on actual government borrowing, but it's the banking difficulties that have caught the adverse attention of international financial markets. And that's complicated both the substance and the communication of ongoing containment and resolution policy. It's, it's a, a situation where uh, decision makers want to be talking out of two corners of their mouths at the same time because they don't want to draw attention to bad things that are happening. And that's been a really difficult part of the management of containment, I think, over the last number of months. Because anything you do, even if it's a good thing, a sensible thing like the nationalization of, of Anglo-Irish Bank in, on the 14th or 15th of, of, of January, can have an adverse effect on how much the government's paying on its borrowing. This is the amount you would have to pay if you're holding Irish government bonds, you want to insure against uh, any bad thing happening to those government bonds. This is what you have to pay. It used to be practically nothing. Uh, sorry, if I point to that, you can't see what I'm pointing. I can't point to that, I can't see it either. But the first phase is you don't have to pay very much. But after the end of, of September, the rate is going up. And it jags up for a number of different reasons. Sometimes the jags up are because of a loss of confidence in government bonds all over the world. Sometimes it's to do with Ireland, and there's a jag up there, uh, which I can't point to, uh, it, just exactly at the Anglo-Irish nationalisation. Anglo-Irish nationalisation protected the government and the government's budget, but it resulted in them having to pay more. So they'd like to have been saying, don't worry, we're going to look after your Anglo-Irish bank, and uh, nothing's going to happen. But, so that has, has been a constraint on clear and, and, and coherent communication. So these are astonishing premiums. It's, you had to pay three and a half percentage point to, uh, to percent a year to ensure against uh, something bad happening to Irish government bonds. The government doesn't actually have to pay those rates when it borrows new money. This market isn't a very isn't a very liquid market, but there were big increases, as we all know, in the amounts that the government had to pay. That has been a big constraint. Now let me move on to resolution. Uh, resolution. So containment is. Uh, stemming the panic and stopping the rot. Resolution entails getting the banks back onto a self-sustaining financial basis, ensuring that lenders are confident that this is so. It also requires ensuring that an effective management team is in place in each bank, and that that management team has the capacity both to deal with inherited problem loans and to move forward with new lending activities. That's the way I'd summarize the resolution uh, phase. And it's really in that context that we should in, be interpreting the government's injection of capital into three of the banks, the departures of some senior staff and directors, the creation of NAMA. That's all around the resolution area. Evidently, this whole process is still in its early stages. Sequencing is an issue here, and the sequencing has proved quite hard to get right. The textbook says that among the first things to be done in any resolution phase is to decide on the allocation of who should bear the losses. It's intended that the, by the Irish government, we may interpret from its statements, that it will assume whatever of the losses are not taken by the shareholders and the other providers of risk capital, because it's guaranteed them. But beyond that, it's still hard to be precise. In order to get more precision, we need to have a good estimate of the full prospective losses. But because of the unprecedented depth of the macro crisis here and abroad, and not just the inherited losses from the, from the developers, getting a reliable estimate seems beyond reach. So we're deciding on the allocation of losses that we don't really know how big they are. Now I think the, the um, we'll hear probably more from, from Alan, the new management and board at Anglo Irish Bank seem to have gone further than others in acknowledging the likely situation, and that only, I think, indicates that uh, there's a lot more acknowledgement that will have, uh, have to be made. The court hearings in the past few days may accelerate the process. People come to realize the, the depth of the losses on certain loans. So the government is starting to deal with this without having fully decided who, who's going to bear the losses. For example, when you inject funds, inject capital funds, into the banks as the government has, that has the incidental side effect of boosting the likely value of the remaining capital owed, for example, to risk-taking subordinated debt holders because it makes it less likely that any further losses will be absorbed by them. 
So that's an unfortunate side effect that some of the benefit of the injection, you have to make an injection, but the way you don't know how much and you haven't decided exactly how it's going to be allocated, that incidentally there's, the, there's that benefit to, um, to debt holders. Buying out those sub-debt holders whose claims are being traded in the market well below par because of the size of the risks they bear does help reduce this unfortunate side effect. So what about, what about NAMA? Um, don't I just NAMA slide? I do have a NAMA slide. So NAMA can be seen as part of the resolution process. It's an asset purchase scheme. It can free the banks from being preoccupied with trying to recover from their largest delinquent borrowers. It uh, allows them then to focus on identifying borrowing needs of healthy customers. And it also replaces problem loans in their balance sheet, loans that have uncertain value with sound marketable assets, NAMA bonds, that can be used to mobilize liquid resources for on lending. Now, other countries have also been moving to set up some kind of asset purchase agency notably the US and Germany. The curious thing is that neither has managed to get a formula that commands widespread approval among experts. There have been such entities in other countries in the past, but doing it in an advanced economy in, in 29, 2010 is hard. A particular sticking point is pricing. If an asset management company such as NAMA mistakenly pays too much for the loans it buys, this will entail an unwarranted gift to the shareholders and to other uh, providers of capital. The US system is stalled for want of a solution to this problem. The UK has chosen a different route, but it too, it's a partial insurance scheme allowed to offer to the banks, it, but it too exposes the UK taxpayer if the premium and insurance deductible paid by the banks proves to be too low. I, I propose a two-part payment mechanism for NAMA, whereby NAMA would pay the bank for loans of uncertain value, only a small part in cash well below the realistic best estimate of the net amount they'll actually recover. And then in addition, a sweetener, an equity stake in NAMA's recoveries for the bank shareholders. Not for the bank, and keep the bank out of this, but the bank shareholders in case their future recoveries are better than expected. Uh, this strategy, I like to call it NAMA 2.0, ensures that the taxpayer does not pay too much. And I'm offering NAMA 2.0 as uh, for, for sale. It's actually it's free. Um, it would separate the bad loans from the bank, just like NAMA does, while sharing the pricing risk fairly between taxpayer and shareholder. Now, unless the loans are valued at unrealistically high prices, the NAMA process will leave the banks with insufficient capital. It will reveal that they have insufficient capital. This is especially true considering the additional loan losses in non-property lending, in credit cards, uh, commercial working capital, residential property, all these other uh, areas of lending that are going to um, uh, take uh, loan losses in, in the years ahead and that are inevitable given the depth of the recession. So as is well understood, the government will therefore have to step in again. That's all part of the process that we know is going forward and inject more capital funds. This is not new. This is, everybody knows this. But it means that it will end up owning a large fraction of the shares unless it can find new providers of capital. Now that should not be impossible since the new investors would be buying into a cleaned up concern. But that's an area that needs to um, be addressed and no doubt will be addressed in the resolution phase. Some have jumped the gun by calling right away, outright nationalization, come what may. I don't see nationalization as a goal in itself. Uh, and my reading of the international evidence, and there's been a lot of uh, statistical evidence, cross-country comparisons on this, is that any protracted period of, of outright government ownership of banks is more likely to have adverse consequences on economic recovery. So I prefer to see the government's ownership share as something that falls out of the loan valuation calculations and the success or otherwise of finding, presumably abroad, other capital providers public or private, but I, I, it's quite clear the government will end up owning a, a sizable fraction of the banks. As we begin to see in very recent court proceedings, there's going to be huge complications in achieving effective corporate workouts for the delinquent loans, um, especially whereas is going to be the case for most of the, the, big, uh, the big borrowers, there are multiple bank claimants. This is true with or without NAMA. The whole area of workouts and recovery is not my area of comparative advantage, so I won't dwell on it. But I'd like just to remind you of one thing. Seizing collateral, taking control of collateral, and liquidating them are two different things. 
while it may be very well be true that this is not the best moment to be liquidating development land and half-completed buildings, that's not in itself an argument for forbearance in dealing with a delinquent borrower. Let me move on to the question of the credit crunch. After massive injections of funds, courtesy of NAMA, the government, and possibly new shareholders, the banks should be ready then to dish out loans to all and sundry? Well, not so fast. Indeed, I think there's a risk of disappointment here. It's not simply a question of pouring in money in one end and expecting it to come out the other in the form of loans. The injections the government is, is making are more about rebuilding the cushion of capital that protects the depositors and other creditors against future risks going forward. It's more about that than about actually making the cash available to, for, for the loans. It will help the banks raise additional loanable funds, help reduce the management's levels of anxiety and fear, and thereby restore some of their willingness to make loans. But they still won't want to lend to poor prospects. And given that it's going to be largely government money that it, that's at risk, the general public shouldn't want them to be lending to poor prospects. I mean, given the budgetary constraints uh, we talk about on board SNP Noah, few would be advocating budgetary grants to be given to loss-making firms that don't have much hope of survival. But a bank loan given to a no-hope firm by a largely state-owned bank is in essence a budgetary grant. So how is the, the crunch growing? Well, you know, fixing the Irish banks is not going to solve all our problems. The collapse in the public finances, knock-on effects of that in compressing domestic demand will still be a factor, as will the downturn in international demand, as is reflected in the sharp fall in all employment important components of manufacturing and service exports, and competitiveness issues and so on. None of these factors result from the undoubted tightening of bank credit standards. Let me show you the, the, the data on, on this. Um, so those are, you can see from 1999 to 2009, a sharp drop in the amount of lending. First of all, residential mortgages from 2008, and now very recently in non, uh, other, other lending. Uh, so we can see this big, big fall in the amount of credit. So is that a crunch? Well, the next slide is maybe a little bit more interesting because you know, there's supply and demand here. Oh, that's just a detail of the last one. Let me move right on to this complicated slide but just draws our attention to the fact that there is demand and supply of credit. So actually, while supply has certainly tightened, you see the blue lines going down, particularly on the enterprises side, that's measured by the credit appraisal standards and the pricing of loans. So that's certainly tightened. It actually happened after and not before the fall in demand. And the demand is measured in the, the red curve there. And the demand, particularly in residential, fell a long time before the banks tightened up. And there's been that survey by Mazars for the Department of Finance also suggests that you know, the crunch aspect of, of credit uh, has not been as, uh, as pronounced an element as, well, as I thought it was going to be. Look, I'm going to move on to uh, prevention because I think I'm running out of time. Back to my prevention slide, which was misplaced there. As the resolution comes to completion, regulatory emphasis will shift to preventing the next crisis. Of course, the way the crisis is resolved will help set the scene here. If bank insiders and shareholders are seen as getting off too lightly, this will surely worsen recklessness next time round. We call it moral hazard. But there is much international discussion these days of ideas for better prudential regulation that would help the next crisis. And most of these reforms center around the idea of aligning banker incentives with social welfare and improving transparency. So better incentives, more information, so that regulators and other market participants can help forestall problems. More equity capital. It's a higher proportion of the bank's lending and activities to be actually funded by shareholders. That's a goal on which there is wide agreement, but it'll take some time because they don't have any equity capital now. It'll take time to build that up. The structure of individual banker remuneration is also rightly under the microscope. Mechanical rules linking, limiting rapid balance sheet growth and other ratios 
just mechanical application. I don't care what you say, you violated the rule that we set a few years ago, you can't do that. Those kinds of things. Not saying, oh, well, yeah, I can see uh, you might be giving the recovery. Yeah, we'll, we'll tolerate that. No, mechanical rules, that could also help. Now, there's a lot of other talk about other types of regulation, especially those relating to fancy derivatives, uh, rating agencies, loan sales. They're important for the world, but they're not important from here because we managed to get into trouble even without the, these. And they don't speak to the problems we've had in Ireland. Uh, the, instead, the goal of better macro prudential regulation should strike a chord for us because it was the system as a whole, it was macro. Not just one bank that went bad, though one bank's egregiously rapid growth certainly accelerated the infection of others. Instead, the error of judgment that led to the bank's lending so much with so little solid security into an unprecedented property bubble reflects a system-wide failure to appreciate the scale of the risk being assumed. So technical discussion of mathematical risk models is irrelevant here. Instead, what's needed is an improved organization, organizational and decision-making skills by the regulator, including a way of, in my view, a way of taking into account in a considered way the warnings of dissident skeptics whose views tend at present to be dismissed as cranky. So there's lots of cranks out there. There's always lots of cranks out there, but how can, how can we find a way of listening to cranks that may have something to say? There's a whole literature on organizational forms and committee meetings and so forth. Uh, one simple one simple change, international sharing of supervisory staff could be a valuable element. So the skeptical Icelander, for example, or German coming in saying, I never heard of this Anglo bank. You are Irish, but it's not good. So <laughs> I don't want to close without mentioning consumer protection. The worst aspects of this, such as out of control loan originators pushing unaffordable subprime mortgages, seem not to have been as uh, widespread an issue in Ireland as, as they were in other countries, in the US particularly. But more generally, the future banking landscape in Ireland needs not only to be safe and sound, but also inclusive and low cost. There's been the beginnings of work on this in aspect in recent years. Um, Combat Poverty did something. Also the financial regulator, whose public information function had indeed come to be seen as, as somewhat gold-plated. Uh, one thing I'm concerned about is that if we end up with a smaller handful of main banking players, uh, this must not be allowed to result in monopoly pricing and neglect of small and vulnerable customers. Uh, in this regard, the apparent de facto retreat of most of the foreign banks is a regrettable development, which I hope will only be transitory. You know, an effective financial system has been shown in numerous academic studies to have the potential to accelerate long-term growth. But even before the crash, Ireland's banking system had not displayed conspicuous effectiveness of this type. And I tried to see, well, how does Ireland shape up with this international comparison? It's very good in, the, in banking contributions to growth, or not so good? Not so good was the answer. And as we move through the steps of containment and resolution towards rebuilding a safe and sound system, let's try to ensure it makes a better national contribution next time. <laughs>